Thinking Aloud, conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with parapsychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. We'll be exploring communicating with spirit today, or if you prefer a more secular term, transcendental reality or mind at large. My guest is philosopher Michael Grosso, who is the author of The Man Who Could Fly, St. Joseph of Copertino and the Mystery of Levitation, as well as Smile of the Universe, as well as The Final Choice, Death or Transcendence. Experiencing the Next World Now, Frontiers of the Soul, Soul Making, and he is co-author of a wonderful volume called Irreducible Mind, Toward a Psychology for the 21st Century. Now, I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Michael. It's a pleasure to see you once again. Well, I'm delighted to be here once again. We're going to uh, look at a very fascinating uh, topic. Some people think of it as channeling or automatic writing or uh, visitation by spirit or hear hearing the call. There are so many different ways of, of putting it, but uh, the bottom line is that uh, in every culture, there are people who feel that they are in a, a dialogue with some form of uh, spiritual or transcendental reality. That is very clear uh, in doing all the kinds of research that uh, I have been doing for years. And uh, it, it's widespread and takes on all kinds of shapes and forms. So it is a topic worthy of discussion because uh, it kind of points to the idea that even when you're alone, you're not alone. <laughs> and there, there are depths to us that, that we can perhaps learn to communicate with uh, and uh, to make the universe a little less lonely place than it seems to be sometimes. You use the example of, uh, amongst many others, snake handlers in some of the uh, southern uh, fundamentalist communities as, as their way of communicating. Yeah, I was surprised to read a uh, an account of, of, of snake handlers in uh, not far from uh, in Western uh, Virginia, uh, and uh, yeah, they they view themselves as communicating with the Holy Spirit, and there are some passages in the Bible in the New Testament saying that uh, to prove uh, that you're attuned to the Holy Spirit. You should not be afraid of being uh, attacked by uh, snakes or uh, that you can drink poison and all of those uh, strange extreme things, as well as the other more positive uh, sort of joyous expressions of communicating. But as a matter of fact, uh, I, what I found when doing this research on this particular case that it was less uh, creepy with the emphasis on serpents and, uh, and, and poison, although there, there are many in this group did do that, and once in a while they died, so they were not perfect in their faith. But I was sort of deeply impressed by one account I read of a woman uh, who described her ecstasy in a way that was uh, totally sort of meaningful to me and, and devoid of the self-destructive aspects of drinking poison and all the rest. So I was, uh, in my account of that part of my research, I concluded that maybe we're being a little too harsh in, in, in judging these folks being crazy as one is tempted to do, if, uh, to prove that you're a good believer that you drink kerosene. Uh, but uh, but that, that is an example where you attempt to tune in to a power that will release you from the ordinary forces of nature. Uh, and I, I, that's one of the weirdest uh, examples because uh, it's, it's, it's risky. But there are other examples of, of firewalking ceremonies, for example, 
where people uh, get attuned to the spirit and uh, in the right state of mind, and they walk uh, on on fire. Westerners have done that. Uh, Joseph Campbell, uh, I met him once in, in the Greenwich Village as we were passing on Sixth Avenue, and we stopped and talked, and he told me a story of how he did it once, and and, and quite surprised me. So Westerners, uh, as well as uh, natives uh, in, in uh, various, uh, uh, some indigenous societies, uh, have all explored. But once again, you can make a mistake, because if you're not in the right state of mind, uh, or if you're too confident, unduly confident, without being in any altered state of consciousness, you can be severely injured by these uh uh, ventures into creative belief. Uh, and uh, so it's important to realize that there are real risks. Uh, and so there is a real and challenging phenomenon here. You seem to be suggesting that it's all about the state of mind, that if you're in tune with the spiritual energy, you can actually survive drinking kerosene or other sorts of deadly uh, kinds of uh, involvements. Well, yes. I mean, there are reports of that happening, and it does happen. But again, that's not something I'm recommending. Just for the sake of keeping the story well-rounded, I included that uh, account. But I've also included the part of the story that surprised me, that it was much more uh, attuned to my idea of spirituality than the, the more dangerous uh, flirtations, as it were. I would tend to think there might be an element of randomness or chance involved in terms of whether when you're handling snakes or drinking poison, it's going to uh, uh, have an adverse effect. Well, I would say that's true for whether or not these extraordinary phenomena work at all. And there are a lot of people who say, hey, I don't have a miracle. No one has ever saved me. Nothing extraordinary has happened to me. I'm a deserving soul. Why not? And, and my basic response is that there is an element of the arbitrary in this transcendental uh, agency that seems to operate uh, and interact with human beings because there's no sense at all of uh, real rhyme or reason. Uh, perhaps the saintly folks and the true believers have a slight edge over having these experiences, but even they are not, there's no guarantee. So there's an element of uh, a mysterious element of arbitrariness in the entire process that I would call attention to. Now, in, in today's popular culture. Uh, there are any number of preachers who believe that God speaks to them or channelers who are channeling uh, metaphysical entities of, of one kind or another. I imagine that uh, if one were to do a survey, the, the practice or the variety of practices are really very widespread. Oh, oh for sure. I mean, there are all kinds of uh of uh, practices uh, and efforts to communicate. Uh, I think, for example, all forms of mediumship uh, come under that heavy. We sometimes talk about, we have this more contemporary term, channeling, uh, but uh, a good deal of the evidence for life after death comes from mediumship. And this is, a uh, again, a, a form of dialoguing uh, with Whatever it is we're dialoguing with, whether it's the subconscious of the medium uh, and, or through the subconscious of the medium connecting with deceased personalities, or whether in, the, in this state of um, this altered state, the histrionic genius of the subconscious kicks in and produces illusions of contact with deceased people. We can't completely rule that out. My own feeling is that there's enough authentic manifestations that leave me with a sense that we may indeed be communicating uh, with uh, discarnates and not merely with the creations of the subconscious mind. Well, their discarnate entities would be a little bit different, I would think, than a transcendental reality. 
Well, true. It, it, it's transcendental only in the sense that it transcends our contemporary physical reality. You're absolutely right. I mean, being in touch with your old granny is not the same as making contact with the your guardian angel or uh, the Lord himself, as it were. Uh, yes, I, 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 that's important to make that distinction. The contact is with a variety of characters, as it were. The personnel is wide-ranging. One uh, very famous example you write about is uh, the story of Joan of Arc. That is a famous uh, story that has made history. This was a young girl, teenager. Uh, and by the way, she wasn't the only one at the time who tended to report about being in contact with angels and guides and all the rest. But at first, uh, Joan simply heard voices instructing her to do the most mundane things like go to church and be good. <laughs> uh, and uh, then she eventually got communications instructing her to visit the French Dauphin with the aim of appointing her as the head of the French army to battle against the French, uh, the English, I'm sorry. And, uh, and as most people know, who know the story, she succeeded in doing that and became uh, the leading inspiration uh, in, in the war against the English and, in a sense, changed history. And then, of course, there were, uh, there were further political developments and uh, the English turned on her and claimed that her insights and her guidance and her supernormal courage was based on uh, evil, uh, diabolical influences, and with the result that they burnt her at the stake. But before they did that, by the way, the, the trial is very interesting. Anyone who reads the trial, the records, uh, is bound to be deeply impressed by the brilliance and, and, and the, the simplicity uh, and directness and manner uh, of the manner in which she defended herself. Uh, I think a couple of plays and movies have been made about this, so it's a widely reported story. But it's a wonderful example of uh, dialoguing with uh, mysterious transcendent uh, agencies. Anything that can inspire you, uh, a young teenage girl to become the leader of an army, is something you have to pay, pay attention to. Something's going on that's very unusual. Something's clearly going on, and it seems as if uh, in this instance you have a, a transcendental entity of some sort or another uh, basically you know, supporting uh, one side or the other side in, in a you know, conflict, in a battle, in war, in warfare. That seems to be the case in the narratives of the Old Testament. Uh, the Old Testament deity doesn't mind bumping off all of the Israelites' uh, enemies. At least that's very clear in the early part of biblical history. When the, po when the prophets emerge, whom I talk about at greater length in my, in my uh, book, I think they reach a higher, more impartial uh, spiritual perspective. Uh, that we associate with the higher uh, Abrahamic religions. But that only tells us that uh, the powers that we're dealing with uh, are subject to change and, and perhaps depend on the evolution and the moral development of the individuals who are summoning these powers. There's no doubt about the possibility of sorcerers invoking powers that be, can be harmful and damaging. You yourself, in your amazing book on the PK man, tell stories about uh, somebody who has a talent for invoking lightning and doing things that uh, apparently were damaging to people. So maybe there's an example of a less evolved that we can possess these powers, uh, or they, uh, certain individuals can manifest them, but they're not completely uh, and wholly pure in their motivations, as we would like to see them. So not only saints, but perhaps less than saintly, semi-sorcerer-like personalities can tap into these extraordinary powers and do harm. Uh, on the other hand, Joan of Arc is still regarded as a hero, not a harmful person. 
Right, right, right. Uh, exactly. When we're talking about dialoguing with the transcendent, it's it's a bit of a two way process. You've got the the human personality and perhaps some sort of a spiritual personality interacting with each other. I, I am under the impression that in ancient times, it was not at all uncommon it, when going into battle to carry uh, some sort of image of the deity and that ancient people sort of imagined when, when they engaged in warfare that it's our deity fighting your deity. Whatever side you were fighting on, you invoked your gods and hoped that your gods were uh, going to support you. So it's, it's, it's a long time coming, uh, if ever, that we reach a universal perspective on this and start to recognize that uh, violent solutions to the problems of life uh, are on the lower end of the moral spectrum of human possibilities. So I think what the point of this exchange is, however transcendent the forces available out there uh, may be uh, that human beings can interact with, everything in the end still does depend on how uh, human beings are evolved and how they deploy and make use of these forces. Uh, and uh, same thing with technology. We can do marvelous things with technology. We can use technology uh, to uh, heal and do marvelous things, but we can also create weapons of mass destruction. So it's, it, it's a, a process that needs to be seen from that perspective. Now, very often, I think, uh, with people who engage in automatic writing and other forms of channeling, it, it does seem as if the voices uh, coming through are uh, offering something of a universalist perspective. Uh, I recall, uh, for example, the Ra channelings uh, uh have impressed me. Uh, and one of the things I like about them is they, they talk about the Im importance of embracing the entire universe, not just part of it. But I have a feeling that every evocation and interaction with the transcendent is always going to be slightly biased in terms of the needs of uh, that particular person. If somebody gets healed miraculously, uh, the rest of the sick who didn't get healed can always stamp their feet and say, heck, this isn't a fair universe. I didn't get an answer to my prayers. Uh, so we're kind of stuck with this uh, perspectivism, I think. Uh, and uh, as for the evolution of, the, of a more universal and higher ethic, uh, maybe that's something we can only hope for off in the distance uh, of time. But meanwhile, it is important to acknowledge the presence of these apparently transcendent powers. They do exist and they do play a role in our lives and apparently in history too. Well, let's talk about a, a case that uh, made a name in literature. Uh, the uh, Pearl Curran, as I recall, was, was her real name. Mm-hmm. You're talk I'm talking about the woman who was a writer known as Patience Worth. Okay, well, the writer was the invoked entity that took over Pearl Curran's life. Pearl was just an ordinary housewife who decided to fool around with the Ouija board. And uh, as anyone who has played with the Ouija board knows, you put your finger on those markers uh, and sometimes they just move of their own accord. That's a type of autom automatism. And they spell words out. I've had a few experiences and they can be striking. However, now and then, a highly gifted person uh, gets involved with uh, automatic writing uh, with a, a Ouija board or a planchette. And um, they uh, channel... Uh, or or hear voices or whatever uh, lengthy uh, philosophies, uh, novels. In the case of um, Pearl Curran, her novels were became bestsellers according to the New York Times uh, bestseller list back in back in those days, which is almost a century ago, uh, and uh, so. 
it shows that, I mean, extraordinary artistic production is often involved in uh, this type of uh, dialogue with the subliminal mind or the higher powers or whatever you want to call it. Not every literary artist or painter or musician is a channeler, but many of the greatest do talk about some kind of inspiration, some kind of sense of uh, things just coming to them inexplicably, uh, unbidden uh, inspirations. Uh, so I think that, uh, and also, uh, while we're at it, uh, I have a whole section in my book talking about the scientific role of inspiration. Uh, although the scientists are more apt to strictly think in terms of uh, the creative unconscious and don't want to bring in the, the notion, the more religiously tinted notion of uh, guardian angels or spirits that are giving them assistance. But apparently the whole realm of creativity, or all, all aspects of creativity, from spiritual to artistic to musical to philosophical, uh, are from time to time apparently susceptible to uh, influences that we are tempted to call transcendent. And I think the more we learn about that, and the more we reflect on uh, on how these things are possible, uh, the greater the likelihood that we might learn, even more ordinary folks like ourselves, to tune in to these extra dimensions of creativity that may be available. We're not all going to be like William, we're not going to all be William Blake's, uh, but uh, but we may it may make a difference if we open our minds to some of these possibilities. I think the interesting thing, since you invoked the name of William Blake as a good example of a highly creative person, he was a poet, he was a mystic, a visionary, and a fine artist, uh, but he was also regarded, I believe, by his contemporaries as somewhat insane. <laughs> well, he, he, he certainly did uh, have some strange habits. And uh, he and his wife uh, liked to play Adam and Eve together, and every now and then they'd have visitors come and visit, and they'd be stark naked walking around singing of strumming on musical instruments. But uh, uh, yes, they uh, if, I guess if you carry your explorations into the transcendent far enough, in a society that's a little uh, more, let's say, uh, level-headed and concretely realistic in their outlook on life, uh, you could be perceived as a crazy person. And as, But I would think as long as you don't do anything terribly crazy, you can get away with it. I imagine there were those uh, who regarded Joan of Arc as, as crazy, although I, I guess eventually she was condemned for witchcraft, I believe. Yeah, I think in her day, in her in the context of her life, the uh, the the judgment was not that she was crazy, but that she was uh, in league with the devil. We and I often hear uh, from viewers of this program when we talk about subjects like this and related subjects, they say, you know, those demons are very sneaky. They will try and fool you. And, and to, they'll pretend to be your deceased relatives or they'll pretend to be uh, the past life memories that, that you have or they'll pretend to be some sort of angelic being, but they're actually out to seduce you to do evil that you should therefore never have any kind of discourse at, at all except through the yeah, appropriate uh, church authorities uh, with transcendental reality. Yeah, well, that, that, that's a reasonably uh, understandable, commonsensical common attitude. Uh, it, is, it can be quite dangerous to flirt with forces you don't understand. On the other hand, it's part of the creative task of highly creative people to be daring and, crea and, and courageous. And unless you're willing, uh, I'm assuming you're reasonably sane to begin with, unless you're willing to take chances and not be cowed by all the dangers, uh, I don't think uh, it's possible to reach 
uh, the heights of our creativity. So yeah, there's an element of risk, but there's always a point where we can be, we can uh, invoke common sense and rationality and say, no, no, this is going too far. Uh, or one can even argue with the spirits, as it were, or with one's inspirations and, uh, and qualify and say, well, I'll accept this, but I won't accept that. Um, so yeah, it's, it, there's an element of risk. But a mature, evolved person should be able to handle it and uh, uh, the risk. Uh, otherwise, they tend to surrender to mediocrity uh, unnecessarily, I would say. Well, there are cases, if we look at uh, automatic writing as, as an example, there are, I don't know, there may be tens of thousands of people who have endeavored to practice automatic writing. There may be a dozen examples or two dozen or three dozen examples of really high quality material that came through uh, consistently sometimes over many years. Uh, sometimes the channeler or medium is, is deceased and we are now left with a body of work, uh, the Seth material some people would cite uh, as an example of very high quality uh, spiritual teachings or the A Course in Miracles being another. We have to make our judgment as to what it, it is, is worthwhile. Now, as far as the Seth material, I, I, I remember reading some of that material, but then I found a book that was supposed to be from her uh, through William James. And uh, in my judgment, uh, I almost immediately judged against that interpretation. I did not see William James at all operating through the writings uh, of that entire book. And quite honestly, I disposed of it very quickly. Uh, others might see it uh, as reflecting the mind of William James. I don't. That doesn't mean that all of her work was without value, or nor does it uh, deny that she was a talented uh, challenger, uh, uh, channeler and, and did, in fact, have some unusual gifts. But like everything else, we have to discriminate. Even Shakespeare wrote some bad lines, right? <laughs> we make our decisions. We say, well, I don't like that play. All the rest are terrific. So I think that's the, the only sensible way of reacting to that particular challenge. There was an interesting case uh, you cite of a, a man who began spontaneously challenging or channeling, I think, through automatic writing, a particular spiritual entity, but uh, and it seemed very promising, very high level, but as he attempted to reproduce the phenomena, it sort of deteriorated. Yes, that's a very interesting story of, of Mr. A, who, who was a friend of uh, Frederick Myers, one of the great psychical researchers. And Mr. A had a four-day experience with automatic writing that was extraordinarily intense. And just to summarize it, the first thing that happened he began talking, using automatic writing, and he contacted an entity that called itself Clelia, and it was a woman, a rather mysterious woman, and the one thing that she did was uh, challenge him with all kinds of puzzles, anagrams and stuff that he couldn't figure out the answer to, so it, it struck him, I'm talking to an entity that knows more than I do that's above me and different from me. And so he was almost immediately enthralled by that. Then he found, felt a romantic connection with this woman. And all in one or two days got involved with the fantasy that she was going to be uh, reincarnated in a short time. And he was went to sleep that night admits he was unable to sleep. He was so inspired by this experience. By the end of the fourth day, uh, the behavior uh, 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 on the with the automatic writing shifted and led him to believe he was being tricked and deceived. And so finally, he became so intellectually involved and analytic toward the process that he could no longer do the do the writing, do the automatic writing. 
But it's a fascinating case because it was written up and a whole bunch of uh, very impressive uh, psychologists got interested. I mean, Jung read about this, uh, Myers, of course, Janet. The idea that you could enter into dialogue with your own subconscious mind and be challenged, surprised and amazed and even seduced by the emanations of your own subconscious mind was pretty mind-blowing stuff for these uh, uh, pioneers in, in modern psychology. But as far as uh, Mr. A, the experience was uh, thrilling and fascinating, but in the end, disappointing. There's another case. I don't think you wrote about it in your book, but you're probably familiar with Theodore Flournoy's uh, book, From India to the Planet Mars, is, is another fascinating uh, example. Yes, and I do remember, I have read that book, and I remember uh, the, the, the medium whom he analyzes uh, came up with, uh, actually invented a language, a, Ma a supposedly Martian language with a mythology, and she was, and those who listened and followed her story, uh, were completely absorbed and, and taken in, shall we say, by this uh, spontaneously uh, created mythology, but Flournoy, when analyzing uh, the material, concluded it was uh, simply imaginary, that there was no factual basis to any of the claims. And I think he did a good job of exposing uh, that fact. So, you know, we're faced with a, a, a problem, a challenge here that human beings seem to be in touch with, we'll call it transcendent sources of knowledge, but those transcendent sources can mislead us, enlighten us, lead us in armies, get us assassinated uh, or burnt at the stake. It's a dangerous game that we're playing, so to speak, when we go out of the boundaries, past the boundaries of normal intercourse with uh, embodied human beings. But nevertheless, uh, it, 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 that world is there, and those possibilities uh, are not going to go away. So the more we learn about it, the more alert we become to the dangers as well as the possible advantages, I think the better off we are or will be. It seems as if what we're dealing with is, is a kind of uh, interaction or dialogue between the human psyche and some other form of uh, non-human uh, consciousness. Well, it seems that way. Uh, it, it, and um, on the other hand, it's conceivable to me that the subliminal mind consists entirely of human forms of consciousness that assume uh, transcendent and even divine uh, uh, dimensions and aspects, and that what we are dealing with is something that is uh, more than human, but not extraneous to the human dimension. And, and uh, it, 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 it's, that, that seems like a, a real possibility to me. On the other hand, uh, if we take the uh, into consideration that so much of religious experience throughout human history is based on these types of contacts with al allegedly transcendent entities, uh, it, it leaves us with a bit of a problem as to how to assess the entire uh, religious heritage that belongs to human beings. I like to think of it, maybe I like the word uh, uh, co-creative, that, that we're dealing with a kind of pure consciousness, a pure possibility, and the human dimension is constantly co-creating with that transcendent dimension of creativity and consciousness, and creating things, some are beautiful, some are deceptive, some have a dark, evil, destructive side, others are totally transcendent. So that, um, anyway, that's as far as I can uh, frame it in my mind. 
Well, in our previous interview, we talked about the concept of mind at large and how th- th- this concept uh, is very good as at least a placeholder explanation for a wide range of paranormal uh, phenomenon. But it it suggests a couple of things, either that this mind at large represents a a plurality of uh, different types of consciousness within it, or that uh, maybe what we're dealing with is, uh, you know, the depths of the human psyche itself, uh, which also represents a plurality of uh, intentions and and motives. The, The pluralities are based on the pluralities of our bodies, and each of us interpreting this one pure great mind at a different stage of history, a different gender, a different culture, a different language, each of us, uh, and some, there are groups of us too, so there are similarities, are going to extract from this in- transcendent encounter uh, our own version. And in a sense, I would argue that at the core of them all, there is an identity. Uh, and, uh, but that identity is viewed and framed in invariably in different ways because of the inevitable differences of where we are in our embodied and historical life. So I think what I get out of my research is a kind of a tolerance, a sense of uh, the openness to the oneness of the human experience, which also celebrates the, the diversity. But that diversity does impose upon me uh, the obligation to maintain my critical mind. So while I am open to the mystical and transcendent dimension, I'm not, I'm the last guy to say, uh, renounce your rational mind. We need our rational minds to get along in the, in the, in our world of, of, of uh, our embodied existence and even our post, uh, embodied existence, if there is one. So I don't see any problem between accepting the transcendent and science and rationality. We need both to be complete human beings. You uh, probably are familiar with John Klimo, who wrote a book on channeling. Uh, Many years ago, decades ago, I did an interview with John. We titled it uh, Channeling the Higher Self. And basically, his point at that time was that all channelers are ultimately channeling their own higher self, which is, uh, as as I recall, he defined it as the part of us that is in direct contact with the transcendental reality. That's exactly the way I would phrase it, just the way you did. And uh, with with the emphasis, which I'm sure John would agree, that there are different shades, tones, and colors to the way that even if it's the the loftiest apprehension of the most sublime region of the transcendent, it's always going to be colored by the finitude of our uh, particular modes of existence, our language, culture, time, and history. And uh, so, yeah, I I, 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 uh, find that uh, quite uh, consistent with my own way of thinking. Well, Michael Grosso, once again, this is a delightful conversation where you had a chance to explore a very important kind of interaction that takes place that each human being, I think, has to deal with in one way or another, the relationship between the the personal ego and this larger consciousness of which we're a part. Well, I, I agree, and, and I think what we're trying to do, I, I, you and I and others like us, is to remind uh, brothers and sisters uh, that uh, in case they've forgotten or don't want to, for some reason, accept the idea, that there is this additional dimension uh, that uh, is part of uh, the game of our existence. Uh, as you, I'm sure, will agree, large numbers of people uh, live in total oblivion to this extra story of being, this deeper realm. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's an unfortunate uh, decline in the general consciousness. Uh, but um, 
maybe we can do something to reverse that trend. I don't know. I would hope so, Michael. Michael, thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Jeff. And for those of you viewing, I'd like to remind you that you can subscribe to our free weekly newsletter by logging into the New Thinking Aloud Foundation at newthinkingaloud.org. And once again, thank you for being with us.